Hello, gang. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for the follow, Yeti Skull. Hi, dude, Cameron. How you doing? Pie. Nice. Welcome, Avid. Darlington. Hi, hi, all. Welcome back. Hope you're all doing great. We're going to be doing more painting today. I did a little bit of work on, on uh, this painting since last we met. Um, not a whole bunch, but a little bit after after getting off, off the stream. I just wasn't pleased with the figure, so I haven't done that much on the background really. Little bits here and there, but it needs it needs a lot of love. Oh yeah, that that game looks amazing. It's the new um, uh, Dark Souls like, right? Set set in uh, Chinese uh, myth, like. Um, the uh, the Journey West mythology, right? That looks super sick. Yeah, lots of big stuffs popping out. Did you guys see the new trailer for the Batman? I'm all about it. I know a lot of people were were hesitant with Patterson taking the role. But, like, I don't know, everybody freaked out about uh, Ledger as well. And, man, he just destroyed the screen with it. It was so good. So now I'm willing to give anybody a shot. <laughs> I was definitely an early naysayer. Like, what? Knight's tail? Shredded it. Batman trailer looked pretty cool. Yeah, it's it was a pretty solid one. I I think uh, that that's gonna end up being a pretty good movie. I got I got the feel. Yeah, sorry about the auto mod. Still haven't sorted it out. <laughs> it's it's weird what words like set it off. In this case, it looks like Dick of Dick Grayson was just too much for auto mod. Hey Slurpy Pants. Hey, ch -ch -ch -ch. you stop that slurping over there. <laughs> you think Sparkle Vampire? <laughs> Honestly, that's fair. But if you ever watch his, uh, watch the videos of him uh, doing the promo tour for that series, he clearly hated it too. <laughs> you gotta respect a guy that's just doing it for the paycheck. Just doesn't care. I'm trying to bumski little mimium vibes. I have no idea what you just said to me. Was that an insult? I think that was an insult. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fair to feel bad for the guy on, on that one, but I mean, he got paid real well. He became world famous, put him on the, put him on the, uh, on the marquee for sure, right? <laughs> I don't remember Mimium. Was it was it a show or what was that? <laughs> Oi! Stop! Silly beast!
I mean, yeah, I'm still not ringing any bells. Was it a local only uh, IP or? Oh, okay. That's an artist. Bumsky Min Mim. The ho their name is Bumsky Little Mimium or? Oh, I see, I see. Mimium is the name and Bumsky is your phrase for taking a little taste. Just a little. <laughs> you can't use your slang on me. I'm simple. I've been out at sea too long, drinking that salt water. I don't know what the hell's going on. Oh God, Bumsky is his, oh Jesus. I'm sure I would. I'm, I'm so much better than with, with knowing the work. Uh, I am so bad with names. It's really embarrassing at like events and meetups because I, I can never remember people's names. But you, if you, if people were to just walk around with placards with their artwork on, I'd be like, "Oh yeah, I know you." Everybody wears a t-shirt. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> wow, porn star set off the auto mod that time. Look at that. This thing, I swear. Yeah, I know the name Tyler Jacobson, but I, I don't associate the name with the work. So if I saw the work and you said, this is Tyler's work, I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. But the name and the face. Oh, geez. Goddamn Automod. Uh, this brush is, is a sort of big lumpy um, liner that I use for for like real crunchy um, edge work. I love it for, for doing edges like stone, wood, uh, leather, things like that. Things that need, that need just a touch of texture, but can also be very, very sharp. Oh, okay. I try to switch them up every now and then just to keep the brushwork fresh, but it's tough. Because I, I want to make it very clear what's going on in the background, but at the same time, it can't really take away from my foreground elements. So it's just this little push and pull kind of game that I have to play um, using interesting chonky uh, oil brushes. That oily feel, traditional medium. I always liked it, um, but I did go through a phase for sure where I was trying to do really like hard hyper real, just to learn how to do it. <clears throat> I was working in an office with uh, Dan Lovisi at the time, and he's all about that that hyper realism, you know, where you can see every bristle of of beard hair and. It's it's looks super cool, but it is it takes so much time for me. So I'm kind of trying to teach myself to unlearn it a little bit. And I'm loving, love, love, love this like resurgence of this of this chunky, more uh, naturalistic looking painting that's happening, especially like at magic and uh, in concept art in general. Because it was getting all super photoreal, and that was just such a struggle. Just not how I work. I can do it, but 
It is a slog. What do I mean fresh? In in what regard? Can you say the sentence back to me? I'm just blabbing, so <laughs> I and I miss I miss what you guys are, are posting sometimes. Sorry about that, Yeti Skull. Could you please clarify? Song of Freya Elise was another one he has been around since the first Zendikar. Oh wow, okay. I mean, like I said, I know the name. I've seen seen the work, but connecting the two. It's just a mild sort of, you know, been out in the sun too long kind of brain damage. <laughs> At least that's what I tell myself. I've never been great with names. Faces? I can see a face, and I'll remember the face. I could even probably, in some cases, I've been able to, like, art the face, you know? Draw or paint someone that I've seen. You may have noticed it in some of my artwork. I tend, uh, without referencing, I'll, I'll paint, you know, I'll accidentally, on purpose, paint celebrities and things like that. People that I've seen a lot of, their facial features just get stuck in my cranium. How do I mean keeping the strokes fresh by switching brushes? Oh, okay. So one of the things that happens for me is when I'm when I'm painting with a single kind of brush, I tend to use it in the same way. Um, I'll, you know, with a brush that's got a lot of texture like this, I'll use it across a form. And then all the strokes start to look the same. They'll have the same size. So by switching the brush, it kind of makes me, it forces me to rethink how I'm going to use it a little bit. Um, and it, it gives it gives the appearance of on, on a digital painting, it gives the appearance of a little bit more naturalistic look. The problem with uh, the, the problem with using just like one brush throughout the entirety of, of your painting is that it, it will end up looking unintentionally really digital. And uh, it's just a universal thing that I've noticed. So I try to throw in different things in there to just kind of break it apart just a bit. Um, it used to be like I used to challenge myself to paint just with like the simplest brush where I would do the entire painting with just a simple round and It it works you can totally do it and but you have to make up that texture by Scribbling with that brush instead. So it's just a, a quick way to to keep the freshness going and for, I mean fresh in this case, it's just such an arbitrary term. It's not really meant uh, as, as an artistic you know uh, an artistic term. But see how like the texture, if, whoops, see how the texture here, we can, um, we can see the, the canvas in it and everything. And then just kind of overlapping and breaking, exactly, break up the texture, break up the pattern in order to create that feel. You have, this happens naturally when you're painting traditionally. If you are painting fencer style, which is like with the, with the, the hand at the tip of the brush, at the tip of the, the handle, and then kind of doing little swashbuckly, buckle style calligraphy strokes, right? And you get a lot of life and rhythm and, and movement in it. Uh, but if you paint like this with your brush on, and you're doing it you know, traditionally in oil or something like that, things can be very stiff. They're very precise, but also very stiff. And what I like personally in my traditional work is kind of a rough, uh, like movement and rhythm. And I'm trying to mimic that. So it's one of those ways that, that is like a little cheat to try and get that feel and force myself to be a little bit more loose with the strokes. <clears throat> Mickey Rourke, yo, that's a great face for painting. Any tips for using those brushes to imitate materials like wood? Um, yeah, it basically, the, the biggest problem with, with using material style brushes that are gonna give you a specific thing is that you're using a brush on a two, a two dimensional brush to describe a three dimensional thing. So having a brush that's, that says grain of wood on its own, you're going to get, you're gonna end up having the, the textures flatten out it's going to push that into a flat surface instead of being a rounded, three-dimensionally, uh, three-dimensionally Z-deep 
in terms of, of that, that dimension type of surface. And if we're going for sort of Western realism, the idea is to get a little bit of depth. It's to imply a false space, right? So that's, that's kind of the, 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 the thinking in how I approach using a brush in order to describe that, that kind of material. So it's not necessarily having a brush that imitates the material. It's about having a brush and then imitating the material in how I, how I paint over the form in those three dimensions. So let's say, for example, I'm doing bark, right? Which is what I'm doing right now. I could get a brush out. Let's pull one out. Let's do this. I could get a brush out and start just kind of tracing the form of what the bark would be. But the problem is, is let's do kind of a big, this is all kind of falling in the direction of the bark. But as I move forward, it's not giving me that forward feel. The only thing that's giving me that forward feel is these cross contours. That's what's doing that depth. So you you want to eat regardless of what brush you use. This is why I would I never recommend for my students to become dependent on any specific brush. I want you I would want them to think about how to describe that form and describe those those material details in three dimensions with the easiest brush to make that happen. So you might use this brush for a stroke like this to get a little bit of that motion going on, but then I would recommend getting into another brush that does something else. The reason for that is these brushes that have uh, strokes in them tend to, they'll always have kind of the same separation in between the, the stroke. So the distance between that dark mark and the next dark mark is just universal. This is how digital works, right? Uh, it's really hard to control and change that that distance. So that's one of those things that will flatten things out. If this, if you're drawing a, a set of parallel lines that are meant to go down a surface and you want to change the direction of that towards or away from camera, th then you have to think about perspective and you have to actually have those converge or diverge, right? That's kind of where I, I come from in terms of using using these for texture. Does that make sense? Thanks, Darlentine. <laughs> you really have? You've got all the magic cards? That's amazing. I've been signing cards today. I had to go, oh, I, I don't have them here. I had to go to uh, Blix in order to pick up some new gold pens. Of course, my pleasure. Yeah, so the gold pens I got there, I forgot the, the brand. I think it's Pos Posca, Posca, something like that. I was using Pen Touch before, which is sort of like your industry standard gold paint pen. And I've, I've hated them for years. I do not like those pens. I don't think they make good marks. And when they do, it's very short lived. But uh, yeah, I, I got these new Posca ones, which are supposed to be amazing. I can't wait to try them out. Let's do chunky brushes. So here I am, speaking of, of brush work, here I'm gonna use a brush that has little tiny lines in between, and I'm gonna use it to describe the contours, the cross contours of that, of these sort of divots that I'm digging out of the wood. It's very much like carving or sculpting. actual like details like I'm like I was just painting with that brush in terms of your material are probably the last thing to think about when you're defining a material if you're thinking about the the order in which you um, the order in which you tackle the different elements of the recipe for a material the those surface details are the very last thing that I would say you should worry about Bef before that you would want to think about you know, base color, lighting, reflectivity, uh, contrast, drop off. I have a bunch of uh, materials episodes on the Gumroad that you guys can check out that are all about how to discern the recipe that you need for different materials. 
So there was a there was a time there I would challenge myself. I would be like, okay, uh, I want to take the material from this and put it on the the object of that. So I was doing things like making cakes out of denim or like, you know, a sea of of glass and fire. And it was a really fun experiment. I learned a ton. I definitely think I've been working a lot on the forest because it's easier to talk when I'm doing sort of abstract stuff. <laughs> but I imagine y'all are wanting to see some figure work. So we'll get back to that, especially since a lot of this is going to be behind the figure anyway. I don't know. Let's let's uh, let's see uh, let's see hands. Who who prefers seeing character work versus uh, environment stuff, or do you like both? Cursed cakes. <laughs> environment. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any specialists in here? You prefer mech work? <laughs> That's probably one of my bigger weaknesses. Creatures, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I like creatures with character. So the way I classify them, I have I have like different defi definitional classifications for my uh, for my concept work in particular, and I consider creatures that have character to be characters. Even even if they you know wear saddles and shit. All right, let's uh, turn her back on because none of that is visible. I'm just noodling back there for fun. Art is cool. <laughs> yes. Oh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, the creatures. I love the creatures. Yeah. Yeah, anthropomorphic. Well, they don't necessarily have to be anthropomorphic. I mean, I guess when I think anthropomorphic, I think much more human characteristics. But uh, I, I guess, yeah, we could say more anthropomorphic. It's That's a squishy one for me. You like the stuff on God of War? Oh, thanks. That was that was a really fun gig. That was such a dream job. Right up my alley. Yeah, the the thing I was doing, I was working on uh, Guitar Hero and and Tony Hawk games before I moved over to Sony. So I had just about painted the, my limit of hoodies and jeans. <laughs> <laughs> and I vowed never to paint hoodies or jeans again. Big sweaty men are fun to draw. It is known. Okay, well, let's get back to our figure here, or at least the, f the foreground. There's a lot of stuff here that I did not figure out that I just kind of left for later. Save. <laughs> Yeah, that I was uh, a <laughs> I was given that title. That is true. <laughs> it was a weird time. Yeah. And I believe that was documented as well like on one of those one of the behind the scenes videos where they were talking about best boobs in the industry. <laughs> Yeah, it was a weird. That was a weird project. So like, I had I had to do designs for um, Aphrodite, right, the goddess of love in uh, for the god of war. Uh, for that was Ascension, I think. And so I would have all of these different people 
Oh shit, I'm painting on the background. Look what I did. I would have all these different people come into my desk and, and they would send me pictures. They would be like, this person is super hot. You should, do, you should use this part. You should do this. You should do that. So Aphrodite was this amalgamation of, of everybody's favorite you know, porn stars and things like that. <laughs> Actresses they really, really loved. There was an interview with KK and he said he just had folders filled with that whale creature. Which whale creature? Oh, totally. <laughs> All right, so this hair has to be fixed. Where did I learn art? All over the place. Uh, I had friends that were artists when I was in high school, so I started drawing around then and uh, <clears throat> spent a long, a, a lot of time studying with them. Um, and then college was really, that's where I really unlocked the potential, I think. But I've always, always sort of been an autodidact in that like i'll go out of my way to challenge myself with little little sort of exercises and things like that i'll try and invent ways to to challenge myself with uh with the knowledge or to test my knowledge to see if if uh if i've got it right you know what i mean like cursed cakes exactly <laughs> Your favorite concept was Artemis? Oh yeah, I loved the Artemis character. I was really bummed she didn't make it in. Uh, but I mean, for that game, we bit off a, a lot more than we expected. Like we, I think that game was multiplayer and it was way longer than the previous games. It was crazy. Your uncle worked on God of War, that's awesome. That was, that was such an important game in my youth. Like I've, I've said before, you know, God of War and uh, God of War 2, totally changed where I was going in art. So when I finally got to work on a God of War, it was, it was kind of amazing. Here's kind of a, here's a funny story about God of War and, and, and my experience with it. So like I, when I was kind of looking around, I was still working at Neversoft, but I was looking around at potential places to get a gig. And I was trying to think what the best studios would be that would make that would challenge me to build a portfolio that could get me in over at Sony uh, so I could work on a God of War game because that was kind of my dream and <laughs> I I tried I interviewed and did art tests for like three different studios and a, and a couple of them were pretty big but I they they, they weren't as big as Sony and my thinking was, what I'll do is, you know, I'm at Neversoft and I'll just build up and I'll build up and, and I'll get to Sony after a few years and I put in my effort. And I tried all these different places and I got rejected time and time again. And finally, one day I was like, fuck it. I'm just gonna send my portfolio to, to Sony. And I did, and they actually responded. And I, <laughs> I went in for the interview and it was, yeah, it was history after that. But. I had no expectation that I would get that job. I thought it was way beyond my capacity at the time. Just goes to show, sometimes if you bat out of your league, right? Intentional studies and stuff. Um, there, there are definitely two ways to go about practice, right? There's the, there's, it, I'm hesitant to 
assign them the traditional phrasing of, of quantity versus quality. Um, but that's kind of the philosophy at hand. It's, it's not accurate, but it is kind of the idea. Essentially, you can brute force this. You can totally brute force learning art of any kind. You can br brute force learning anything. It's just hours. It's mileage, right? So the more time you put in for the longer amount of time, the better you're going to be no matter what. Um, but the way I approach it is my thinking is that there is a there's a capa there's like a capacity limit for that. Um, one of the easiest ways to learn is to just brute force it, but that's also one of the easiest ways to grow to hate the thing that you want to learn um, because it no longer is a joy; it becomes a, a chore. And if you can avoid that chore feeling for as long as possible, I feel like your learning experience will be more joyous, more exciting. Like you'll get up in the morning and be like, I want to do this thing still. Um, if you're forcing yourself to just churn and burn, you're going to burn out. It's going to happen real fast. Um, and I think that does happen to a lot of people when they're when they're churning actually on the job. So if you're on the job and you're just working your ass off all the time, uh, you lose the love for whatever it is that drew you to it in the first place. So you want to be careful. Um, the way I approach that early on when I first I've tried them both. Uh, so when I first started, it was churn and burn. I, I just dumped hours. I barely slept. This was in a, when I was in college. So I was in college and I knew that I had to pay my own way finally. So I barely graduated high school. I graduated high school with like a 1.6 or something like that, which is like a D plus. <laughs> I didn't care. You know, it was high school. It, I had much bigger shit to worry about at the time. And uh, when it finally came around for me to have a chance at college and I realized that I was actually paying for this myself, I started taking it super seriously. You know, I only slept like two to four hours a night for three years. And uh, yeah, it was it was it was a hard, hard push. But also I, I was seeing the I was seeing the advancement that I really wanted. And, and I was really uh, I was extremely competitive at the time, which helped a lot with that mindset. But as I graduated, as I got out, I, I started worrying about having to pay off my loans. So I started working. I had already set this insane standard for work time. So I just applied that to freelance. So I had multiple jobs and I was working constantly. And man, it wasn't long before I did finally burn out and I just needed a break from that stuff. And so I stopped working on stuff. So I, I stopped brute forcing it and I started trying to think of ways that I could make it fun again. And that's where I came. That's that's where I started approaching it with the, what's a way that I can what's a way that I can make an exercise that I know will challenge this concept or will force me to kind of practice a concept that I struggle with, and and make it a fun thing. So I started doing little projects and little exercises and just making up games. I wanted to make it fun again, and that's so a lot of the things that I teach in terms of exercises are intended to be done as kind of a fun alternative to a brute force because i know what it i know what it can do to you i know what it can do to your body just how you feel about art about dealing with people it's it can be really tough some people are really successful with that some people are very very successful with just brute forcing and it's great they do great work they're they're the top of their fields and that's awesome but i think what i started to think about was comparing i had to analyze for myself what how do i define a good life lived what what is it what does it take what what are the qualities that i want to have look that i want to look back on as i'm you know aging out or in in my deathbed and what are what are the things that i'm going to say okay this this was a life worth living and it turned out sitting around and painting all the time really wasn't the thing. So I wanted to mix that in with other stuff, making stories, having adventures, meeting people, listening to people, that sort of thing. It's just, a, it's just figure out whatever it is, whatever your philosophy for a successful life or a life well lived is going to be you need to sit and think about what's right for you because we all have different goals some of us want glory some of us want the money some of us want uh, the relationships the friendships the lovers etc 
it's that's all good all of it is good you just need to find the 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 path that's right for you and then just follow that and don't ever apologize for your decisions even though people will always tell you you should do this you should do that don't listen do the thing that is going to that when you're breathing your last breath and you sigh out you know your your life breath you're content then you've lived a good life. <laughs> Fabric. <laughs> you want to quit retail and make your living off, off your art? Hey, then maybe now's the time to do that, where you really, really crunch. Um, you know, save your energy and and focus more on getting your getting your art out, getting, getting more exercises in. Don't, uh, you know, that's the time when you would let something like a retail job kind of fall to the wayside as you really pump everything you've got into getting better. There's nothing wrong with that. If you have responsibilities, that, that can complicate things a lot. You know, children, family, uh, debt, things like that. There's always, there's always a, you know, buts. Excuse me. Unfortunately, unfortunately, your life has been a trail. But, oh, a trial by fire. Thrown to the lions type deal. Biggest burnout was making 120 illustrations in the span of three months. Holy shit. Dude. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a hard pass for me. I could not I couldn't do that. Well, I, I did do that. I could not do that again. It's just too demanding. Wow. Yeah, that sounds about right. I've I've had um work request quotes like that for board game work and it's really really demanding especially if you're the only artist on a project because they're trying to cut you know budget issues because board games are notoriously low budget but that's in in so many ways i mean it's good that you that you're able to look at it and see it as a growth period for yourself but at the same time i recommend totally against sacrificing yourself for somebody else's mistaking and budgeting it's it's a real quick way to burn out for and get really not much out of it i i always recommend against that if something is planned well you shouldn't have to crunch you shouldn't if something is being paid well has the right amount of money you shouldn't have to crunch they need the right amount of artists to get everything done. That's that's why really good producers and the, the the people that make the decisions about time and money, the really good ones are are worth their weight in gold. Because they they know how to avoid waste. They know how to keep from uh, burning people out. You're very young in your art career. Yeah. Hey, we all do it. Um, and, and we all get taken advantage of a couple of times. It's just, it happens to everybody. Um, I did uh, design for these, for those, for miniatures right out of, I think actually I was still in school when I did them and I got totally boned on those. They essentially tried to pay me in miniatures. It was the funniest thing. It's a way that I check if I have uh, errant pixels is 
I'll, wig- I'll grab something and then wiggle it, and you see where the errant pixels are lying. You don't notice them when you're when it's sitting still, but when it moves, that's when you can find your little your little lost boys. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about careers is it doesn't matter where you're at in your career. There's always going to be some dues to pay. You know, like right now for me, my my dues to pay are like I have to prove that, I, you know, even though I've done the job of an art director, you know, numerous times now, I've never had the credit. So now that my dues to pay are getting credit for that sort of thing. And it's doesn't matter where you're at. There's always dues of some kind. The real question becomes, you know, according to what you've established for your personal definition of a good life is what you're willing to what you're willing to give up to pay those dues. Is it really worth it? And that that's an answer that's different for everybody. All right, so I've kind of just laid her out, but I haven't done any actual proper lighting on her. So I'm gonna use this layer, clipping it down, and then I'm gonna just kind of start implying a little bit of lighting and see how it, see how it looks. For this, I want a brush that can be very subtle. Oh man. I know exactly what you mean. That's a that is one of the big issues about it, you know. And, and it's it's something that I've I've dealt with uh, relatively recently. The idea that it's it's sort of your the portfolio bias, right? So somebody that's higher up that maybe is a money person and doesn't really, you know, they they don't art direct or they don't know uh, or they don't understand artistic skill sets. They expect to see they'll look at your portfolio and if they don't see exactly what they want in the portfolio, then they assume that you can't do that thing. Um, not under, they, they, they are failing to understand that what we do is a skill set rather than a specific genre or style. And it happens in all of the creative fields. Uh, it's just this assumption that you can't, if you, if you haven't done it already, you can't do that thing. And, and when I say haven't done it already, like you said, if, you, if there isn't evidence that already exists that you've done it, then you can't do it. When I, when I, would do, when I was the one responsible for hiring, I would always examine the skill set and worry way less about what actually you know, was in the portfolio. I wanted to make sure that there was a good design sensibility or uh, uh, excellent understanding of light and color and form. These were the things that I looked for when I was hiring. I didn't, I didn't care if, if you uh, painted exactly the thing that I was looking to hire you for. So the run, see, the rim lighting won't work there. There's nothing uh, uh, dark to put it up against. So, whoops, that's all stuff to think. Oh, no, this whole time I've been painting on <laughs> hate Photoshop so much. <laughs> oh, that undo, go back to previous layer thing is fucking infuriating. That's all right. We'll make it work. We always do. We trudge through. It is the artist's way. Okay, then if that's the case, I'm just going to paint without uh, clipping on. I don't know how to turn that off. If you know, please let me know. You will you will be saving me the suffering of a the, the hatred that burns like a thousand suns. I hate it so much. This elbow's definitely off.
anytime you're going to add um, something to delineate edges, uh, you know, any costuming, anything, honestly, in your painting, you want to make sure that you're following the the local perspective of that thing. So if you're creating beads and you're doing the ellipses of the beads, you must turn the form as it goes around into space. Otherwise, it'll flatten everything out and you want to avoid uh, avoid flattening. If you're doing uh, Western representational style, you have to avoid flattening at all costs. Surge Hex, welcome. How's it? Welcome, Ghost Shiv. Hi. Good to have you all on. I'm uh, edging you know, implying the shadows and the little hints of, of uh, ambient occlusion with a rich color that is the complement of the color of the object that is blocking the light. And this is meant to kind of push the, it's, it's gonna create a little bit of, of nice uh, color vibration for the eye. Um, and it makes, it will make the colors feel richer than they are. Classic illustration technique. Um, simultaneous contrast it's awesome to play with I did check out Slain it's uh, quite interesting <laughs> super over the top I liked the art style it was clearly very like 80s punk rock kind of deal it was cool thanks for the rec No kidding. Wow. That's that's pretty awesome. They're a very good team. And I, I like how it just drips with like the 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 history and the myth. Nope, that's too warm. I want something cooler. I really, really like painting with the uh, with that hard brush, but sometimes it can be difficult to control. So something in the middle, something that has hard edges, but also has really, I really like this brush because it has the hard edge, but also has very subtle control for the uh, opacity. See how, how much I can play with that.
I may have to cool off these colors quite a bit to imply the fill light being the light source that that the fill light being the the forest itself. Let's do a new layer and experiment with that. I found that like maybe half the time when a figure is not seating well into an environment, it's because they're, they don't feel like they're being lit by that environment. Now the direction of the light might be right, but the, the ambient colors that should be affecting all these surfaces don't feel like they belong. It's, and it can be really subtle. It can, and it's one of those things that you kind of, it just takes a great deal of observation. We were talking about exercises a while ago. And one of the things that I would do for my personal challenging was I would challenge myself to paint when I wasn't painting. So I would sit and, you know, just sitting in, on a park bench or something like that and just observing the light around me I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what why does why are the colors that I'm seeing there wh why does the light behave the way it's behaving and understand the the sort of the cascade events that that ultimately ended up in the the total picture that I chose to think about and then I would paint it in my head, like, okay, these are the colors that I think I would use. This is how I would simplify these shapes. This is, it, it was very much um, all of the decision-making that you would make if you were actually painting from life of that scene, but doing it all in my head. And it was great because I didn't have to carry my paints around at all, <laughs> which are very heavy. I feel like we've lost a lot of that kind of olive skin a dark, more darker tone. So I'm gonna do a new layer. You work in cell shaded, almost painting style. And after finishing, Quick Cheat is taking the colors from the background. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a great way to do fill light. And I mean, illustrators do it too. Just uh, color picking or when you have a loaded brush, you just kind of flounce around the image and uh, and introduce those colors in other places and it will automatically have the effect of unifying your uh, your color key I definitely don't want to lose that indigenous skin tone even cool that off even a little bit more and see that's too much oops color pick that and sort of the advantage of doing that painting without painting method is it i found for myself it helped me learn to diagnose much quicker when something was wrong when something felt out of place in my own work um so that's one of the reasons i, I do teach that is it's one of the one of the best ways that you can ensure that you will be continually improving is if you are capable of being self-critical and analyzing what is wrong in the same way that you would have uh, you know, we, when I was a student, we would have, the teachers would have us students critique each other. And I think the reason that they did that, you know, now that I'm on the teaching side of things is it encouraged us to approach this, these, these bits of artwork with that critical mindset and hopefully begin to approach your own work with that same kind of critique and to be able to really sit back and go, okay, this is, this is the problem here. This is what needs work, etc. Like this is why the colors aren't matching. And it, I found it to be very useful. <laughs> Art is one big cheating marathon. Oh, brother, you are so right on that one.
Hi, Mish. <laughs> you were a mess on crit day because you were being critiqued or because it was hard to critique others? That's the question. The best philosophy to growth you found is to have one person to be a mentor, one person who's the same skill level as your competition, and one that you can teach. Honestly, that's actually a pretty good approach. And those are all things that I recommend that everybody do. Because as an artist, your path is going to follow that kind of, it's gonna follow that route. Um, even if you even if you try to not, you, want to, you do everything you can to avoid, you know, becoming a mentor and teacher yourself, it's gonna happen. It just happens. Your experience and, and your knowledge will at some point end up being broadcasted to somebody else that needs it. And it's just, I think that's, that may just actually be an, an aspect of life itself, but I, I have absolutely seen it. Like all of my students have become teachers. Um, they're all leaders in their own, in their own ways. And it's amazing to watch and see how much that experience expands where they are as a learning artist as well. You learn so much from teaching. Uh, it's one of the, I think it's one of the fastest ways to learn is to try and explain what it is you're doing to someone else. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. You never finished your work out of fear because of the of crit day. I understand. It is it can be intimidating. One of the things that can hurt you the most, I think, when you're when we're talking about learning is to not challenge yourself. That peers thing is a really good point. You want to you want to be in a position where you're not the best in the room. Surround yourself with the best and you will learn so much faster. I also tell my students to not just look as the, look at their peers as competition, but to look at the professionals in the field that they want to be in. And it's harsh and it hurts, but holy crap. Talk about quick um, jumps forward in skill. I can think of numerous situations in which I w was painting alongside or, or doing artwork alongside somebody that was, you know, just the top in the class. And this, this has happened so many times. And then nowadays they don't do art anymore. They just stopped. You know, different jobs now, or they or they never went past that point. Because sometimes when you're when you're the best, it can be intimidating to put yourself in a position where you're not that anymore. So I find it's best to just do that early and do it do it frequently. <laughs> Awesome. You never had crit day. Oh man. We had lots of crit days. With the school that I went to, a lot of the crit day stuff that we did was done on account of mm, giving us industry experience. Because when you're when you're working, you know, with directors and things like that they can be picky they, they may have a very specific vision or they don't know what they want and you have to figure it out with them and it can be a, a real slog and a struggle and frustrating so crits became kind of a way for us to start facing that potential future well no guaranteed future honestly and uh yeah we did it a lot i think it's a it's an excellent way to kind of first of all, deal with those kinds of insecurities. Like you start to, you really start to separate yourself from your work. Like you are not defined by your work. It's it's a good way to do it. Like I have, 
uh, my my uh, patrons on the Discord, they they uh, crit each other all the time now, and it's so great to see because they're applying the things. It's it's amazing to watch the all of the elements clicking into place from their perspective because they're they're able to start seeing it in other people's work and seeing it in their own work and that development is amazing to watch I forgot I had these in here. That would have been useful. <laughs> okay, that's the tree. And then we have this one figure, which isn't going to help me much for ref. Let's use that. You tried to get into the biggest game uni in Scotland, but due to not having one grade in math. No kidding, they denied you because of, of maths? Eesh. I'm actually extremely lucky that my school didn't, the college that I decided to, to go to did not look at maths. They didn't even look at my grades. Like I said, I barely graduated high school. If you don't have a B or higher, Jesus. I'm extremely lucky that we don't have that rule for art schools in the States. That said, our public education is pretty <laughs> lackluster here. They keep defunding it and then wondering why our grades are so bad and why we do so poorly in, in compared with the rest of the world. Like e even when I was a student in high school, they were already cutting budgets for the arts programs. And now I, th I think it's completely non-existent at this point. Oh, yeah, our schools are a hot mess. And unis here are also pretty messy. I mean, in, just in the time that I went to the specific university I did, which was a pretty hot shit art university, uh, the pricing went up like six grand in my first two years there. And right now, the pricing that that specific school has, I couldn't afford to go there at all. Even with, like, I didn't... I paid out of pocket, but it was all loans, everything. Uh, my entire education was, was funded by loans. My housing was funded by loans. And if I were going into that, you know, right now at this time, there's no way. I left, uh, I left university 150K in debt. It's no wonder, I, I, it's no wonder that people don't choose not to go now in the States. Because it's it is it's just a mess, and then we have these rich assholes going in and buying their kids' way in. Like, oh, it's infuriating. Our system is awful. If if you're careful and thoughtful about how and where you get your information. I think that you can definitely do it on your own. The biggest issue that I see is that there are some really 
in general, there can be a lot of uh, very toxic philosophies that go around. And I'm, I'm always worried about uh, these young up and coming artists that are that are being taught some pretty harsh and, in my opinion, toxic uh, opinions on things. And then they carry that through. And I mean, one of the things that I think sort of a traditional education gives you is it really forces you, for one, to work in a group. When you're an autodidact, uh, there's very few opportunities to do that, to have to deal with accountability, to have to deal with uh, managing social expectations and things like that. It's tough. Excuse me. Uh, a lot of people are either practical learners or theory learners. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I would say I'm probably on the theory side. I mean, for me to cement it, it's a practical thing. But for me to get the to get to break it down, it's theory. I like I'm one of those people that learns. I, I've learned a ton from other people's mistakes. That's why I like to listen to people and hear what their experiences are so much is I feel like I learn a ton from just taking apart and examining what I would do or what would I do differently? You know what I'm saying? Um, can I give some examples of the worst? Oh, it's just like, it's like, uh, you know, things like just not knowing how to take a critique. That's not something that happens to you when you're teaching yourself everything online and you're doing it all on your own. You don't know how to take a critique. Um, you're very invested in your artwork as a representation of yourself. Um, I think that's one of the biggest dangers of doing this on your own is that you, you conflate who you are with your work itself. And those two things are not the same. Um, and it can lead to some really unhealthy approaches and, and interactions between yourself and other artists or even uh you know yourself and, and employers like it's it can be very tough this whole chest section needs work come on now starting to chug Okay, that was faster, much faster. Um, what are some other examples of bad ones? Um, there's some. There's a lot of one of the things that happens by having to work with other people or just sort of uh, learning alongside other people doing the same thing is you uh, kind of develop a sympathy for learning, and I think it does tie into the eventually teaching kind of thing. Um, a lot of the ones that I've known that have done it on their own have kind of almost a Schmeagol style like overprotection of what they've learned and they're very like they are not generous with their knowledge in in the way that I think is really helpful for your growth as an artist by like I, I said before teaching is is I think it's fundamentally necessary as part of your career path to learn this stuff because you need to learn to explain. When, when you have to sit down and really analyze what it is you do and explain it in, in clear and concise ways to somebody else so that they can also do that thing, it forces you to seriously understand what it is you're doing. And there's nothing like teaching to do that. Just merge that down. Let's do a let's do a liquefy. Oh. oh, I'm on a, on another layer. Hopefully, this does not crash my machine. Knock on wood. Yay! Let me shrink this down so I can actually see your guys' chats. You just reminded you of what your art teacher taught you about not being in your work. You spent weeks working on one drawing and then they made you destroy it. Yeah. That's a very uh, good method. You can't be overly precious about what, about what you do. This is the problem with the liquify is it can really 
stretch your pixels too much. You can do this or you can do a puppet warp. Puppet warp tends to keep the pixel information a little bit better. Um, but I feel like since we're painting, it's okay to kind of squidgy around pixels a little bit. The way your brain works, the idea that someone could do something and not be aware of why is just crazy. It's entirely the case though, especially I find with autodidacts because they're taught a way to do something and they're not taught to question it. So then it becomes this, it becomes almost a religion in how it's done. And then there is no question about it. It's just, this is the way it is. I am, I am a huge proponent for questioning yourself, questioning everything. You know, even the things that I teach, I want my students and I want my patrons to question and to and to think if it find better ways, challenge the thinking, challenge the philosophy that I'm presenting. Because shit, I want to I want to learn, too. And that's another thing that can happen that I think is also it tends to be in the autodidact side is uh, understanding that you can learn from anyone and anywhere. Like there's always, there's always potential lessons to be learned. Uh, it can get, it can be easy to sort of dismiss somebody that you consider lesser than yourself in terms of ability and decide that they don't have anything to offer in terms of a, a an opinion or a, uh, an approach just because they're not, you know, they don't have, 40,000 followers or whatever. <laughs> you got to eat the fifth cheese toasty too. I'm all about them cheese toasties. Yeah, unfortunately, that's very much something that happens with this. There's that old saying, be careful who you kick on your way up because you'll be seeing them on your way back down. I'm paraphrasing horribly, but that's super true. Treat everyone with respect. Assume that everyone has something to offer. And then wait for them to prove you otherwise. I mean, of course, See what I did there. Yeah, I, li I like those choices. You don't need to respect somebody automatically, but you know, base level respect, treat them with kindness, and then, you know, once they prove themselves to be an asshole, then let it rip. <laughs> I usually don't even interact so much with the people that I discover to be assholes. I just tend to just slowly, quietly remove myself from where, you know, from that group or whatever. Just not make a big deal out of it, just walk away.
Might be getting a little chunky with these, but we'll get the anatomy sussed out and then uh, we'll figure out the proportions, which is kind of backwards, but eh. We're just having fun together, hanging out. Kind of turning the, the thigh out a little bit might be too much. Yeah, that's better. <clears throat> Guy you talked with a lot worked his butt off and became an art director. And the moment he put AD on his Facebook, the swarms of people that messaged him saying, "Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's true." How did uh, how did I get work with most of my freelance clients? Cold calling, head hunting, etc. I'd say cold calling is almost a, I almost never would do that. Uh, there was a bit of head hunting. So I got my Wizards gig. My, my very first work with um, Wizards of the Coast was on some D&D products. And that was, uh, what I did is I went through the jobs portal and you know, you give them kind of a base resume and then you just send it, you sent in a few pieces of work. And I got a, I, I got a like, 30 minutes later, I got a rejection letter that said, oh, thank you for applying, but uh, we currently have enough artists, blah, blah, blah. This was like 2006 or 2007. And uh, I was like, well, damn. And then maybe two hours later, I got an email saying, hey, actually we have some, we have, uh, some emergency work. Can you do some interiors or can you do a cover? I don't remember if it was a cover of the interiors I started on. And I was like, hell yeah, give me that stuff. And that's where it started. And then from there, because I was on the artist roster for uh, Dungeons and Dragons, they also had the uh, Wizards of the Coast uh, Magic Department also had access to those uh, files. So I ended up getting picked up over there not long after. So that's kind of how that happened. It was like a mix of both. It was good luck, um, head hunting, and then me just applying through jobs portals. The cold calling thing is it's tough. It's doable. I have heard stories of it working, but I have not had success with that. And I mean, even lately, you know, I'm trying to get more art director work, right? But again, this is the issue is I don't have it on my resume. So I've been applying at places and I've been getting lots of rejection letters because I don't have that. The experience isn't, um, it's not in paper, right? So, I mean, I'm still struggling with this stuff too, just like you guys. The key is to not, again, don't invest uh, your definition of yourself in whether or not that works out that way. Luck is such a huge part of it. And I mean, I mean that in the most specific way. Like there's, there are so many times where you don't know what's going on on the other side of that email. Um, maybe they're busy with production or something like that. And I mean, it, it's just random. So what you got to do is just keep working on your portfolio, um, keep putting in the effort to improve, always compare yourself to where you want to be, and then just regularly send that stuff out. And eventually, uh, you know, providing you're, you're putting in that, that work, you will find a place. The important thing is to not define, define the quality of yourself by the quality of the place or your perceived quality of the place. Work is work. As uh, Stephen King put it, it, when your writing puts food on the table and, and, and uh, you know, pays your light bill, you're a professional. And I adhere to that 100%. I don't care how you do it, who you're working for. If you're, if you're doing art for a living and it's putting the, the bread on the table, then you're an artist. You're doing it. Just keep at it. How important do I think resume is to getting work? compared to just having a good portfolio? That's a good question. And it's, uh, in my experience so far, it's just mostly dependent on the individual employers. Some employers place a great deal of uh, import on your resume. I have 
in my experience, this is not a this is not a hard rule or anything. But in my experience, I'd say when that is the case, usually it it is because the people that are doing the hiring or they're doing the gatekeeping for the hiring are not artists. Uh, so when you're looking at places that do um, that have an HR department that does a lot of the hiring, like the first gatekeepers are very rarely the people that do or, or have knowledge of the stuff that they're looking for. They'll have like a rudimentary understanding of it, but they're not uh, going to be, um, they're usually not going to be full on artists themselves. So that's why it's good to have an online presence. It's good to uh, go to these events and these meetups because you meet the people at the, at these different studios that are the art people. And if you work on developing a relationship with them, then you're going straight to the source. Then they're going to be the ones that go, hey, uh, we have an opening. I remember this one person was particularly great with environments of this style. And, uh, you know, they're, they're young and they're hungry. Let's, let's get them in for an interview. And that happens all the time. Applying has changed so much over the years. Oh, yeah. And it won't stop changing. So long as the Internet is involved and, and the Internet is evolving, you're the the system by which that we that we are hired and even fired will continually evolve. It's just going to be super crazy. I can't even imagine what it'll be in 10 years. No, no, I welcome the questions. That's why I'm here is to hang out and answer questions and shoot the shit. Yeah, buzzwords, keywords. I mean, nowadays uh, you can be looked o looked over because you don't have enough followers on your social media. But the, usually, again, this is the result. This is the result of uh, people like in HR or something like that that are gatekeeping, and it's their job. So that that's understandable. It's their job to gatekeep and make sure that only the best people come in through the company. But sometimes their sta the standards by which they gatekeep can be a little bit iffy, in my opinion. You hope Lightbox is happening next year? Man, uh, me too. That first one was awesome. Hey, I'm super bummed it's not happening this year, or that they're just doing an all digital one. I think it's still going on. It's just gonna be uh, purely digital. A lot of studios are really interested in people that are versatile in 3D landscapes. Yeah, uh, that seems to be a, a pretty constant theme is the expectations of skill sets are just broadening and broadening. I mean, it got to be the point for concept art that even even you know on on god of war the concept art that you had to do was it had to be photo real i mean that you were doing i remember doing like these turnarounds and things like that where i had to figure out you know the tiniest of details and that was the expectation and now it's even crazier these days the expectation of of finish and quality for what should be ideation work like viz dev you know previs things that are just helping you kind of lock down the look i always preferred when i was doing characters and, and creatures that uh let me allow this real quick hold on sorry i i always preferred doing stuff that was looser you know not not much more tight than what we're doing and going to be doing here and then passing it off to the next person and then and then collaborating and having their interpretation of that thing because they're bringing a different skill set to the the collaboration and so like a 3d artist would be picking up my character and i there were some 3d artists i loved working with because they were also concept artists and so we would we would evolve this thing together if we were permitted to and it was always way more fun to do it that way than to just outline something pour for pour and say you got to do this you know what i'm saying yeah followers is a terrible metric i i don't recommend doing that Oh yeah, I mean, you—if you look at the concept art done for like Star Wars, right? They're all amazing designs, but they're very like they're simple sketches. People, the different artists down the line were permitted to extrapolate and build on that collaborative process, and that's what I love. I like that part of doing team artwork, but it's become less and less about that. It's become about uh, is this concept art effectively marketing material in and of itself? That's just the way things are now. So it's, you know, you just go with the flow. But I really like the collaborative process more myself. Uh, 
Mish, you're not wrong. I mean, the, unfortunately, um, yeah, follower count can come into play. I think eight years of studio experience will trump absolutely your follower count. So I don't think you're, you should worry too much about that. So eight years of experience and a solid portfolio will be everything that you need. These things are kind of falling out a little bit. You always thought concept art was just to inspire, not finish. It used to be. Uh, it's definitely become a little bit more about refined stuff, but there are examples here and there of studios and projects where that's not the case. A lot of times it seems to be like animation or uh, sort of, you know, your more avant-garde uh, studios that are welcoming the, the art and expansion of it. It used to be that way, but now it's definitely... When you look at concept art on ArtStation, for instance, you're going to see that the vast majority of it is very finished, very refined. I mean, look at the Marvel stuff. Those guys are all amazing. And I mean, they're doing like you can actually see the 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 fabric shape, the, the textures of the fabrics on those paintings. Like that's what's expected there now. It's amazing. Looks super cool. But that is that is deciding everything at that stage. Art looks damn cool, though. <laughs> I love that team. Those guys are all cool. I'm just going to paint over these necklaces. Callum Alexander Watt still works in line and flats. That's awesome. Some, some of the pros, like the old school pros especially, are totally able to get away with that, and, and it's awesome. I'm so glad that some, some are able to keep it alive. You respect those people that never had an online presence and are thriving? Yeah. I mean, there's some people that do it. Like, basically, they manage to find a niche. They hold on to that, and then they don't need the online presence because they are doing that. They're still doing that thing. They're, they're the, they're the go-to person for that thing. 100% you are right, uh, dude, Cameron. The, there is this uh, confusion between character illustration and concept art. I always liked doing the character illustration, but for me, the concept art itself was the fun part. It was that exploration, the studies, things like that, especially with creatures. It's weird. There aren't that many creatures in this project I'm working on now. Blood flower. There's going to be... Two, probably. I'll have to do something about it. I'll have to think about how I can implement more creatures into it. Because in, uh, you know, ancient uh, Mesoamerican myth, there are so many cool creatures and critters and interesting things. I'm changing the angle of the clavicle. It was off. Generally, you're not going to see the, that big deep dip of clavicle unless a person's extremely skinny. Problem is, it's such a it's such a cool visible landmark that uh, we tend to overemphasize it quite a bit. I'm using uh, colors that are definitely meant to evoke blood without kind of getting too messy with it. So I'm thinking it would be sort of a pigment. I mean, it, yes, it's got to have blood in it if we're talking about it in sort of the, the magic effect that I'm thinking for these characters. But I don't want it to look like just wet blood. I want it to feel kind of a dry pigment, you know, that is caked on a little bit. Unfortunately, when blood gets really dry and cakey, it gets really cracky. All the proteins break apart. Um, so maybe I will do that like on, on the edges of it, make it more crackled uh, to help sell the blood feel. But I don't know. We'll see. This is like, like I said, this is still exploration at this point. We're just trying to get the feel 
And also have fun painting, I mean... Why not? If you wish to keep it in reality, you can explore the avenue of mutations and creatures. Yeah, I mean, it's not meant to be in reality at all. It's meant to be very hyper-fantastic. Uh, like, um, like I said, God, this is this is a, a kind of an homage to that kind of, of fantasy like God of War. I'm just going to cover up these necklaces for now. I need to figure out this chest. Sometimes you can you can get caught up, and I do this all the time. I'll get I'll include some kind of detail, and I don't want to cut it out, and then it's it's causing me all sorts of problems in actually figuring out the underlying anatomy, and it slows you down. It's better to just go ahead and, and get rid of that detail and get the underlying anatomy and or the underlying structure, whatever it may be, right. I mean, this works for environments the same as it does for characters or creatures. It's just the same kind of logic. I wanted to change. Originally, she was, she was much smaller in the breast area, but I wanted to kind of build on the pregnancy feel, but also without kind of getting fetishistic about it. God damn it. Oh well. When you're doing this without without reference, you you're gonna find it's a slower experience because, and and this is the way I approach it when I'm not using reference for something, is I'll just push things back and forth, back and forth until something feels more right. And right now these don't feel right at all, um, so they there's gonna need to be a lot of um, refinement done for shape and line here. Because it's just it's not right, but uh, again, it's that so the ability to self uh, critique and and say okay, there's something wrong here. It's the only way that you can get away with um, doing work without very very heavy reference. And unfortunately for something like this, I can't. I do have a bit of reference, but I can't really whip it out. Another thing we've got that's going that's pretty kooky in the states is our prudishness. It's unfortunate that we're such prudes. <laughs>
Let's see about that bounce light. I think part of what's not working here is I keep trying to imply the uh, pectoral muscle attachment with that. And I think I'll have to just light the breast shape separately. The insertion, it's weird how how much certain details can tell you about, you know, age and and, uh, and health and all that stuff with, with a figure. And just the angle and insertion of the lines of the pectoral area on male or female can change, like, weight, age, all sorts of things. It's amazing, these tiny little details that can tell so much. And if they're not right, they they stand, they, they're very obvious. So I want to ensure that that we're, there's, a, there's a very strong implication of youth here because it's kind of the, part of the, the story. So I may need to just give her a little bit more substantial torso there to help sell that that uh, particular line of the chest. I have to move this belly button all together. Yeah, that's definitely seated better. Sometimes you gotta do artistic, <laughs> yeah. It's a fine line.
Don't want to over focus on one area too much. It's really easy to start uh, noodling in one area. Very tempting. See if we un animation it just a tad. Ooh. Not what I intended at all. making that face. I figure if somebody's holding a skull, they have a right to make kind of a crazy face, right? <laughs> Find out. Yeah, exactly. I do like the idea of kind of pushing her into unibrow territory, but I'm afraid it would be too fierce. So I want to imply it with uh, just kind of a darker brow ridge, kind of like what I've got, like that little bit of extra shadow there.
So it's it's hinting at that hinting at that particular visual feature without you know giving it outright. A show don't tell situation. I love that warm reflected light on her face. We don't have anything that's going to give us that, so we'll avoid it, but it would be cool. I could I could warm up the background, I suppose, instead of keeping it this kind of cool, you know, frigid white balance. I'm not trying to make her look made up. I just think eyelashes would be beneficial. They can be very tough to indicate without it ending up looking like, you know, kind of a, a Glen Keen eye. You're heading out? Hey, thanks for hanging, dude, Cameron. Appreciate the chatting. Take it easy. <laughs> I'll try and fix the damn auto mod. We'll see. <laughs> I just have my one powerful urge, which is laziness. I'll, I'll try to remember to get on that. Take care. Thanks for hanging. Homie staying up late. It's only 4 a.m. Oh, 4 p.m. I see. <laughs> it's 7 here. How long have we been on? Let's see. Two hours? That's not bad. We've got a little time. We've, we've done quite a bit today, although I've merged it all. So I can't turn it off and on for you. Excuse me, which is something I always like to do. Just to check, you know where we're at but let's go ahead and merge all this down anyway ha ah! I'm going to see if I can get away with a different color rim light on this side See how adding like secondary and tertiary lights just rounds out the form so fast. It's kind of why I know I mentioned before that it, that I tend to paint light source by light source, but it's because once you get your first your primary light source, whatever's actually doing the fill, it can be a primary light or even a even a rim. I suppose could give you enough, but whichever one is giving you the the it's it's doing the strongest fill wherever like so for instance you know on my face the lighter the orange lights giving me a strong fill there's lots of detail coming from the blue but the orange lights what's giving me the most so that's the one that I would figure out first and I do all of my rendering on that light and then I figure out the others and fill up the shadows with extra light 
And as you fill up those and add lights, it's going to make the form feel round for minimum amount of effort. Kova, hey, Kova, stop. Don't do that. <laughs> you want an adventure, get an animal with OCD. I need, I definitely need shade in the JD stuff now. So real quick, we're gonna do some fun material pops. Let's go darker and richer. Yeah. I love this kind of rendering where it's just quick, dirty, implied. Because it, for some reason, it has the tendency to look more real to me at times. So we figure out our side. I'm going to. I'm thinking it can't be a white, a cool, it's going to definitely have to be a greenish yellow. That's our speculars for this jade. I've, t I've told my students dozens of times and my patrons, I love painting shiny stuff. <laughs> Because it's the easy, it seems like it would be really tough, but actually shiny stuff is the easiest stuff to paint. Do a couple of real hot. Go a little bit bluer with this jade piece. Notice the fluctuations of color there. I really like that. Some jade is a little cooler. Some is warm, warmer and more greenish. Some is ruddy orange. Just a little bit of variation like that can go quite a long way.
Oops, I'm doing a clipping mask. She's my focal point. So here I'm going to allow myself to get to add accent colors that are going to pop more. And, and, I, and I need them to pop more than the background. Even though the back, background does have quite a few sort of rich color pops in it, with it, whatever's in the foreground needs to pop more. <clears throat> M -m 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 -m. Too much pop. Too much corn pop. I think definitely for this I'm going to need reference for flowers. It's just not something I paint all that much, to be honest. So we'll probably have to come back to this part. I'm not even sure what kind of flower I want it to be. Not even, I'm, I don't know what I'm painting currently. <laughs> Winging it! I know the dominant effect I want it to have is white, because the white will play so strongly against her darker hair. Yeah, my flower anatomy is pretty lacking. <laughs> We'll leave it for now. It's not right, but it's good enough for now. Lots of stuff still to be sorted out down here. This is awful. important thing with these parts is just to make sure that you get the rhythms right.
Here's a question for those of you that are uh, inclined to answer. How did you find out about the stream? Was it uh, one of my posts? Uh, you were already familiar with the artwork or did you just kind of wander in? this might be a broad this is going to be more about the picking up the lights from the side gotta get that top of the tibia or the fibula You've been following the art station for a while? Oh, nice. Well, that's awesome. Was it because of the new, uh, the new, um, the video ad I posted? My goofy Twitch ad. I think that was probably a really good way to go. I did, I did notice there was an increase after that. I think people just don't know what I do on this thing. You know, Twitch is so much more uh, the video game side, but I've seen a lot of artists doing what I'm doing. You know, they just, it's just a venue for them to hang out with other artists and chat and make work. Oh, no kidding. Huh, awesome. Well, damn, I super appreciate it. These damn things keep sliding. I got I got these headphones, these little earbuds, because the big headphones were so hot. Um, and there's definitely, so this is much, much cooler. But, uh, yeah, this, they're weird. I gotta try the different little attachments so I can get something that seats better. I just got them. I'm listening to Toss a Coin to Your Witcher. Should definitely do the same thing, broadside that light. I know I'm gonna have to hit that thigh muscle pretty sharp, but I'm pretty sure I don't have the right, uh, like the light is right, but the anatomy isn't quite right there. So I'm gonna have to go back and edit that a little bit. Cause that, the sweep of this muscle back here is, it's the belly of it is too low and it looks weird, but I will get there. I just want to build out the rest of the forms. I I like I tend to prefer rim lights like this that give you that can give you a little bit more information as they come around the form so it's not just, you know, just an edge. I know it's tempting to just hit the edge because it's it is such a cool effect, but you, you're missing out on so much extra information. If you just if you just bring the light just slightly around, the biggest artists on Twitch are the ones that post a lot of YouTube. Really, I'm I'm just uh, using YouTube right now as an archive for the videos. I, I don't make a bunch a bunch of uh, YouTube original content. I should probably remedy that. I know that that's one of the ways that you can draw a lot of traffic to your Twitch is to make ironically make uh, YouTube specific content and then link it back
the whole the whole process of managing social media, especially like content uh, driven video stuff like this is such a strange world. I want to capture just the, the shelf of the pelvis there. Maybe pick up some of these nice pinky reds. It's really hard to tell what will blow up and get yeah it's impossible like i that's one thing i've learned as i've tried to develop the social media side of what i'm doing is that i have no idea what people like and uh i guess what i'm trying to do at this point is just to make stuff that i like and have a venue to do it so that's where we're at now i'm just making ips and at least i got something done right Merge it down. I do that just so that I can uh, edit these contours more comfortably without having to fool around with different layers. something wrong here this the obliques and the belly need to be separated I think not a hundred percent so that's why I'm doing this on another layer could just be I need to push the obliques back a little bit because it's meant to be a smaller bump 
and then bring out the belly in front of that. I don't know, that's probably not it. No, it's too small. Yeah, that's closer. It's not right, but it's closer. Maybe there's a connective bit here where the pelvis slides up. Hmm. No, nope, it's just something's wrong there. Right? Ah, goddamn. It's hard to tell. Maybe I'm not sweeping out the belly too uh, enough horizontally. I have to stand up and pooch out my belly on camera. <laughs> what happened to all my viewers? Let the obliques go into the belly for now, and uh, I'll need to reference that later. Oh, uh, it's all right. Well, you can send it. I just won't open it in here. I'll, I'll, I'll save it. Thank you. I super appreciate that. Bring this up, this light source here. I need to let's get a harsher.
Go back to this, handle that bellying of the muscle I was talking about. Grab that warmer gray. Let's just use it real quick to denote the rim lighting from the other side. Just keeping notes for myself. Oops. Doing this on the bottom layer again. I think it'll get broader here. check my fill because I tend to keep my values so tight. Oops. Do a quick black and white look. My proof setup. I can really check my values real quick. The values are tight. It's not, that's not the problem. The problem is just like I'm worried that the focal points and the points of interest won't read very well if I don't give them enough light. So we're just going to cheat and grab a screen layer and just hit it with a cool light. It's too bright. Got about 10 minutes left. Got a lot done today though. A little more color. Kova, hey, tss, tss, tss. don't do that. Hmm. 
I'm gonna leave the the uh, the blood right now. That tone, the values where they're at, because I think the the fill's gonna definitely be more um, specular there. So kind of unifying a lighter tone isn't of great import right now. I'll come back in and add the speculars in a sec. These, this one doesn't need to be so strong because it's facing, it's uh, running parallel roughly to my overhead light source, so it's not going to pick up as much light as, say, this one would. Of course, the underlying colors are not right, but right now I'm thinking only about value. I can, I can uh, lock the transparency of this layer and then change the local hue of the specific areas. I just need the light to feel right. Of course, there's going to be a lot of light down here. We didn't get much to that foot at all. Let's turn off our values, see how we're doing. When in doubt, uh, when I'm doing this kind of thing, sometimes I'll leave it in this proof, uh, the proof setup of grayscale and paint within it. And, and since we're on the screen layer, it's just going to be the light side of stuff. And I can get that information in and I'm not worrying about colors. So it's a, it's a good way to kind of like, if you're getting stuck, to uh, take a step back without without really losing anything and, and you know, going degenerative with the, uh, with the pixels. So I definitely want this, this specular that I've got on the, the belly skin because the, the skin is stretched taut here which means it's got to have a specular. But also we need a specular for the blood and the specular for the blood is going to operate on a different contrast drop off because it's meant to be more slick, less, um, less rough. The liquid or the pastiness of it has smoothed the skin so much. Like even this, what I have here is probably too broad of a specular for what I'm after. Yeah, exactly. 100%. I like that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> so when I turn the color back on, uh, the colors won't be right, um, but like I said, that's not really the concern right now. My concern is very much just getting these little value hints in here. go blue yeah lots of it's grayed up a lot of stuff let's turn it off and turn it on so you can see it made the legs really gray but that's okay um, we can fix that we'll, we'll just uh, lock off the transparency here and then change the temperature a bit and my tone lock is doing all the work making sure that the values are roughly in the same place so the value is not changing now. Now it's just the temperature. Ah, sneaky cheats. <laughs> That's my sneaky cheat dance. You like that? Getting away with murder. Visually speaking. <laughs> Thanks, Misayo. <laughs> I like to lean in and shout that at people just randomly. Sorcery! What 
foul sorcery is this? Art Hackerman, I love it. So I feel like her proportions head to body ratio are right for her age, but I've the the way I've carved in on her face makes her look older than I'm intending. So I'm gonna have to think about that and find a way to soften it just a little bit. I know she's very cheek bony. I'm, I'm making her deliberately slender. Maybe her arms got too short, I don't know. Thanks for the follow, Ghost Bear. <laughs> I super appreciate it. So, let's see. I don't know, what do y'all think? You think the arms are too short or is the head too big? It's something I do all the time. I make a head too big and, and uh, I tend to make arms usually too long, but I think in my effort to get the torso to feel uh, lengthened, I've overshot the arm shortness. They're definitely meant to be bent. Maybe, maybe if I light it, because it's not lit. That's not cool. You can't leave the arm unlit. That's a, that's a sin. I'm gonna make just a new layer instead of painting in the screen. This way, just doing the opaques is just faster. I don't know why that happened. I did not tell it to do that. We're gonna have to bring in our Little bit of rim. Oops. I know that I want to imply, um, you know, some pretty dense and 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 sort of wiry musculature. But it's gonna be a lot of back and forth as I sort start to fill out the limbs. Get some of that bounce light going on. Everybody loves some bounce light. Bounce light makes the world go round. So I need to keep this mass, all these uh, tensor muscles up here. Because I'm, I'm kind of turning the, the, the hand out a little bit awkwardly. It's possible, but it's, it, it's one of those things where you have to light it just right. And it's, that's easier said than done, you know? Forearm musculature can be really, really tough to imply, you know, the, the hand the hand shape that you're making because so much um, so much implication comes from, you know, how how much the fo the forearm is changed by the the arrangement of the wrist or the fingers. See how like just changing the, f you know, flexing different fingers changes the musculature out here. It's, it's so weird. So learning the musculature is really important, but understanding what, which stuff is flexed with which hand poses can help sell the pose better. So 
it's tough. Like what I've got right now, it's turning the hand, the, the wrist is turned out wrong and the musculature isn't backing it up. So I got to figure that out. It's going to be a little bit of hit and miss action for a while. Part of this is also understanding that I, you know, I, I'm terminating the wrist too late. This is, this should be the, the termination of the wrist and, and the beginning of the, the, uh, carpals there. Yeah, see how just adding that already kind of lined up the musculature into the thumb a little bit better? But again, I want her to feel like, you know, she could club the shit out of a baby seal. So I gotta have a little bit ex a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Just referencing it is probably the the right way to do this. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> bit of a little bit more of a little more meat to that palm you know that thumb ball so when I'm painting hands and wrists out of my head I just end up painting my own and so they always look a little like they always look a little like pig hooves <laughs> little trotters mm -hmm, little trotter guy we can't have that so, our makwa weedle, makwa weedle is in the wrong spot now. I gotta move it. These things happen. Okay, now I can see the problems in the hand a little bit better because now the thing that she's holding is is going to dictate how the hand wraps around it. So we need more of that mass on the top side for sure. And then we know now that these are fingers. There's a lot of this lost and found in how I work. Especially when I'm being lazy about reference. Oops. photo ref for a sec here. Hmm. Yeah, that bicep, I need to refine that bicep. I just have the bicep going the full length of the arm and that's not how it works. It's got to go into like a tendon that then inserts into the, into the bone there. Um, so I'm going to have to fix that. Um, for next session. But yeah, I think this is a good, this is a really good stopping point. We got a lot of good stuff done today. Looks like I'm averaging maybe like three days or three three full sessions for these illustrations. I'd like to get them done faster. I think what I'll probably do is start working on them a little bit more in between because the timeline that I've got scheduled for this is I wanted to do. I wanted to do the book in a year, 
Um, and we're already like a week. What is this? Yeah, about a, uh, a week. I started this last Sunday. So we're a week in and I'm not even finished with one one image. So that's way too slow. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to devote more time to this on my off time or just stream random stuff. Would you all be interested in that? Just like rando unannounced streams? Do, do, peop, do other artists do that? I don't even know. <laughs> that, would, that might be the way to do this. It's just those in-between days, you know, throw in two or three hours here and there and, you know, just, just a, a stream and not talk so much. I don't know. You'd be down for that? Oh, they do. Okay, cool, cool. So, the, and that's outside of their scheduled one. So if it's scheduled and unannounced, people actually do watch that stuff. That's good to know. Some don't keep a schedule at all, really? What is a focus tag? Oh, okay. So what, where do I put up that tag? That's, that's in the, the tag where of the, the stream info? Sorry for all these questions, guys. I, this is all very new to me. Okay, yeah, I'll put up, I'll make a little graphic for that so that we'll know when it's a, a focus day. I like talking with you guys too, though, so I don't know. <laughs> I'll figure this out. This is all a learning process for me. Okay. All right, yeah, so maybe my in-betweens will be like focus days where I'll just chat a little bit less and do a little bit more painting. Yeah, that's all I can do. Just have a good time. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all for hanging out. Appreciate it. It was a, it was a good couple of hours session. We got some good, good arts in. Yeah, I'll try not to stress too much. I just want to make sure that I'm like that what I'm doing is entertaining and educational on some level. Like that's just the teacher in me, you know? <laughs> So yeah, thanks again. Super awesome chatting with y'all. Uh, have a good, I guess, beginning of the week. We'll see you on Tuesday. That's great. I'm, I'm glad you guys are learning a lot. Stick around. There's, there's going to be tons to cover. So yeah, anyway, as always, paint smart, paint sexy. I'm Izzy, a professional writer, concept artist, and illustrator. I've taught painting for a dozen years or so on and offline. Many of your favorite illustrators and designers have studied with me or under me and have gone on to teach in their own right. You're here because like they did, you wanna to learn to paint realistically for illustration or concept art. Well, worry not, you're in the right place. Grab a seat. I want you to join me as I explain all the aspects of image making in extremely digestible and clear monthly lessons. Not through the lens of silly how to paint hair or eye demos. That shit is carnival tricks and you're not really learning anything except an exact way to render one thing in one manner. This is painting mysticism at its worst. Watching these kinds of exploitative lessons won't help you level up with your understanding. Sure, now you can paint sparkly hair, but what if you want to paint a dragon or figure out how to render a sea of fire or depict a one-eyed transgender space marine dying in the vacuum of space? Painting and image making are tools of communication and can be learned by anyone willing to put in some time. Light grammar is for language. Light, color, and form literally follow a formula. Painting well is not a matter of chicken bones, zombie crackers, and the ever-dismissive concept of talent. Learning with my series, Izzy's Logic of Light and Color, will give you the tools and understanding so you can analyze light and form in reality and bring it to life in your work. Using this simple system I have distilled will help you harness your art to share your ideas as you've always intended. When we are children, we all draw in symbols. Symbols for our house, our hands, the sun, the grass, our pet lobster. As we grow into artists, we must learn to throw away symbols and begin to draw and paint what it is we actually see. And as we grow further, we learn to paint beyond what we see and what is actually there until finally we move beyond this and learn to trim away what is actually there so we voice only what we want. With me, you're going to have to buckle in and maybe take some pain meds because I'm going to rip out your normal person's eyes and replace them with a painter's eyes. I'm going to restructure how you see 
and how you understand what you're seeing, I'm going to turn you into a painting machine. Truly, anyone can learn to paint realistically if they can both determine what they're seeing or imagining with basic and straightforward rules. Once you understand the mechanics of light, color, and form, in reality, you will have the capacity to paint anything you can see or imagine realistically. After that, the real fun begins. Here are some of the ways you can join me and master the logic of light and color. The very first lesson of my series is totally free on my YouTube channel. In that lesson, I give you the three primary rules of light that are the very foundation of painting and understanding light itself. If you do nothing else to make your painting mastery easier, at least watch this amazing little lesson. It will do more for your basic understanding of light than just about any tutorial you can find. When you're ready to get deeper and you feel like you have those first rules figured out, allow me to utterly blow your mind with the next episodes available on Gumroad and ArtStation. As we go deeper into the rules underlying the logic of light and color, I carefully and simply explain important and interesting elements. From beginner to pro, there is an amazing amount of information available. Each concept has been distilled into the clearest explanation you're likely to find anywhere. Like episode two, where we cover the atmospheric effect and how that relates to light, scale, and distance of objects in reality, and how to render it. Or episode three, where I hand over the ultimate key to controlling value in your paintings. Episodes five through eight are all about rendering materials. Want to understand the logic behind rendering metal, leather, hair, transparency, damn near anything. I even cover the logic behind painting special effects like fire, neon, or lightsabers in later episodes. The lessons just get deeper and more detailed as I build on the foundations covered in preceding episodes. The tenth gives you the most important rule of composition you'll ever learn to keep your images interesting. The next few episodes cover important painting techniques like my edge control ninjutsu or simplification with the large to small system. We dip a toe in color theory, devote a few episodes to finishing full-blown illustrations utilizing the techniques we've learned so far. Some episodes, like the lighting game or advanced exercises one, the shirt, present cheap, valuable and practical exercises to give you explosive growth in your development. Episodes 22 through 25 cover painting and illustration just like I do for Magic the Gathering. From assignment and inception to signing the painting at the end, each one is full of tips, knowledge, everything to make working as an illustrator easier. Did you enjoy learning how to paint basic materials? Metal, wood, and such? I got three whole episodes devoted to the intricate logic behind painting different kinds of skin. After that, more lessons devoted to pumping life into your portraits and original methods for accurately drawing faces out of your head. From fundamentals to photo bashing, Gumroad and ArtStation have every lesson I create available for purchase a la carte. But here's an even better way to learn with me. Stay current with my latest lessons on Patreon for the lowest price available. Monthly support gets my student that month's lesson, a critique or paint over of their finished work, a discount code for 25% off the entire Gumroad archive, and access to the Logic of Light and Color Discord community, where we plan future lessons, share knowledge, and learn together as a team. The absolute best method is to join my Patreon classroom at the Student Plus tier, where you'll get everything I just mentioned and a free episode from the archive every month to accelerate your mastery at your own pace. You've decided to take control of your painting and master Izzy's logic of light and color. Now it's up to you to choose the path that's best for you. I'll see you on the flip side. Paint smart, paint sexy. <laughs>